Hard disk shucking looks like a great way to pick up some cheap storage options either for local mass storage or to put in a NAS. So in this video, I'm going to look at what the good options are for this, but I'm also going to go a bit deeper and look at external storage options to avoid and perform some performance testing on the disks, both in their enclosure and out to see what you can expect when you remove that juicy disk inside. Also, I'm going to look at how to open the enclosure without damaging it, as the process many guides show damages the enclosure in the process. I do want to caveat, however, that I can't guarantee you won't damage it and that this can impact your ability to return the drive if it goes bad. So you do need to go and move your eyes open on that. But if done right, it's certainly possible to open it without damage. And I'll show you how to do this in the one we're looking at today, which is going to be a Western Digital Elements enclosure. So let's get started. And first of all, which unit to choose. If it's hard to ensure you don't get an SMR drive when buying a bare drive, then it's even harder when you're buying an external disk as the manufacturer won't usually state what model disk is inside and they just quote a model number for the full unit. So to avoid this risk, I'd start by not buying a Seagate disk of below 10 terabytes as those Barracuda drives that often come in these are SMR up to about eight terabytes in size. So if you buy a Seagate enclosure from say one to eight terabyte, it's likely gonna come with an SMR Barracuda compute disk inside. All the small caddies with two and a half inch drives will also so typically be SMR and for these reasons covered in other videos, avoid these. For Western Digital, their desktop drives can also be SMR up to 6 terabytes, but as of today, all of their 8 terabyte and above drives are CMR. And there are some notable exceptions for host managed SMR drives in the high end ultra stars, but you're not going to get these in an external caddy, so you don't need to worry about this. So to be safe, I'm not going to buy an external disk lower than 8 terabytes, and the Element 8 terabyte drive often comes in at a good price point and it's regularly on offer, so this is what I'm going to look at today. At times, disks in external caddies were definitely a great way to save money, but the first tip today is not to jump to this conclusion because it just isn't always true. These drives often come with a fairly short warranty, and when shucking the unit, you do run the risk of causing damage to the casing that could potentially result in a warranty claim being denied altogether. So the first job is to check that the price saving really does make it worthwhile. And actually CamelCamelCamel.com tells us that the WD Blue 8 terabyte drive can come in at a close price point to the WD Elements unit, at least in the US market. And it turns out the discs are actually quite a similar spec with both being 5640 RPM CMR drives. You do get a caddy of course in the price when you buy the Elements unit, but if your plan is to extract the disc from the enclosure, then this may not really add any benefit anyway. So price vary a lot by region, however. So in the UK, for example, the Elements package is often considerably cheaper than the eight terabyte WD drive. So it's gonna be worth checking and comparing. So now we've established the prices to compare, here is an Element 8 terabyte I picked up for 130 UK pounds, and this is actually a good discount on the WD Blue 8 terabyte price of 192 pounds, typically in the UK. So first of all, we're gonna smart test the device, and this is what's gonna tell us what is inside, um, and then we're gonna perform a full surface scan of the drive before I shuck it. This way, if the disc does come up bad, I can return it without any risk from actually opening the caddy. And unlike the Seagate, which often have Barracudas, WD actually often package white label drives here. And these are drives with model numbers that you're not gonna find on a data sheet that look to be built for specifically this purpose. And if we look at the hardware spec, at first look, they seem very much like the eight terabyte WD Blue or the eight terabyte WD Red Plus drives, which also have an RPM of 5640. And if we see how the data sheet performance compares for these, then we see both of these claiming to have 215 megabytes per second for the 256 megabyte cache versions and 185 megabytes per second for the 128 megabyte cache versions. So we're going to performance test our disk also to see how it measures up to these, but right now, this looks like the drive is probably based on the same unit as these two other drives. Um, and I'm going to provide some affiliate links below both the Elements drive, but also what the other options I'm looking at here, so you can go and compare. Okay, so looking at the smart data, we see that it's labeled as part of the Western Digital Ultrastar HE10 slash 12 family. So once inside, we can actually check this, but this isn't likely correct, and it may be based on incorrect data in the smart database. The HE here specifically signifies it's a helium fill drive, which for a 5640 RPM, eight terabyte drive is pretty unlikely, I'd say. So we'll know for sure once it's opened. It's also a 512E drive, which means it's got 4K physical sector size and 512 logical sector size. And it reports that it doesn't support trim, which makes it unlikely it's SMR. 
though some, mainly Toshiba drives, do appear to be SMR without trim support, so this isn't a slam dunk. Next, I would recommend a full surface scan using something like OMI Partition Assistant or just using Check Disk Slash R like this. I'm going to run a full performance test, however, in its caddy to see how this performs out of the box, and this test will involve filling the entire disk with 10 gigabyte files and then reading them off again, and then filling the disk again with 10 gigabyte directories containing about 5,500 mix file sizes, and then again reading them off. And this is going to perform the same job, which is to fully test the entire disk surface and find any areas that are suffering errors. And what we see actually when we do these tests is that for sequential writes, the disk in its caddy actually performs really well. It's getting about 226 megabytes per second for large write performance of the outer edge, dropping to about 100 megabytes per second for the inner tracks. And this exceeds the stated specs of those blue and red plus drives I mentioned. Read performance is also between 230 megabytes per second and 100 megabytes also. So very similar read and write performance for large files. Performing a sequential mix file test, we get about 185 megabytes per second write performance at the outer edge, down to around 85 megabytes per second at the inner tracks. And between 200 megabytes per second and 94 megabytes per second for read performance on these files. And if we perform a sort of 20% non-sequential rewrite test, this is where we rewrite 20% of all of these mixed files, we get about 100 megabits per second and 67 megabytes per second rewrite performance. And this is consistent with what we'd normally see from a CMR disk. And what this really shows is that this doesn't behave like an SMR drive would, where file rewrite performance can actually be really bad. Okay, so having verified the disk is good and the performance tests out in the caddy, let's shut the drive and see what we have inside physically. So just to orientate you on how this fits together, this unit comes in effectively two parts. There's an external case that's made of shiny plastic and you can see it here covered in the protective film. And then internally there's a portion made of kind of this vented matte plastic and this slides out along two rails on either side shown here. And at the end with the power and the USB connector here, there's four plastic tabs which hold the two parts together. So we're gonna to need to release these four tabs and then slide the inner portion out from the external shell. And we're gonna use a couple of simple and cheap tools for this. And I'll also link down below some examples of something like this. And just a note here, right? I've seen a few guys where people leave it along this long edge here where the retaining clips are. But if you do this, there is a fair chance of breaking these clips with this approach. So the approach I take is to gently lever one part of the case away from the other. So you can see here, there's a little bit of pressure around the edge. And then I run a shim down the edge to release the clip from the lips that hold it in place on the internal part. You don't need to leave the clips open as this is how they're gonna get broken, but just use a tool like this or even something like a guitar pick and just run it along this edge. Once you've done one side and the clips are released, you can repeat on the other side and you should be able to see the clips are free and the unit is ready to separate. And once you've done this, it should slide out easily. Now, again, I can't guarantee that you won't break a clip this way, but I haven't yet. And I find this approach um, really successful and straightforward. Now, if we look inside the, um, the outer chassis here, we can see how the clips work. And you can probably see why this approach works okay. There are these four lips that sit inside the clips on the outer case, and they just need to be slid out while applying a slight separation to ease them past that kind of half a millimeter or so lip without actually bending the clips themselves. And once the two parts are separated, you can get to the disc. Remove this clear plastic that connects the activity LED on the board to the front of the case, and you can pop the disc out from the side opposite the power connector easily. Clip this plastic part, which is easy to lose, and the four rubber shock absorbers safe in the box, so you can put the disc back in if you do need to return it under warranty later. Maybe take a picture of how these fit, or you can always refer back to this video if you do need to reassemble the unit. And then there's two screws that fit the USB board to the disc. So remove these and again, keep these parts safe. There's also this retaining clip here that fits around the USB port. Once again, we can see that the disc is labeled as the smart data showed as a WD80EDAZ drive. Also, we can see actually that it is an air filled drive. The giveaway being that the screws hold the top plate on the drive and the breather holes. Helium filled discs are sealed more robustly and they have no breathers or visible screws in the top plate. Now, let's test the drive again performance when it's actually SATA attached. Now in Windows, you can enable or disable the drive's write cache via the device manager. And this instructs the drive whether it should use its onboard cache or not. And this option allows you to select between optimized write performance or effectively write safety. Because data in cache can potentially be lost during a power outage, even if the drive has reported to the OS that the write was successful. 
With the Elements USB enclosure, the OS believes the cache is disabled, but the USB adapter appears to enable it behind the scenes, as the disk reports it enabled here in HW Info, as seen here. So when attaching the drive directly via SATA, we're going to test the drive with both write cache enabled and disabled to see what this does for performance. And the results here are actually pretty interesting. First of all, without write cache enabled, we see a significant reduction in write performance with the drive producing just 75 megabytes per second max at the outer edge, dropping to around 48 megabytes per second at the inner tracks. Read performance isn't impacted, as you'd expect, as it performs similarly as it does in the enclosure at between 226 megabytes per second down to about 100 megabytes per second across the disk surface. Mixed writes vary from 95 megabytes per second down to 58 megabytes per second, and that's actually around 20% better than large file write performance. Again, read performance on this test was similar to that of the enclosure, with around a peak of 200 megabytes per second and 92 megabytes per second at the inner edge. So this isn't a surprise, but it does show that the Elements USB interface is doing something with the drive write cache, despite it being disabled in the OS. If we enable the write caching on the SATA attached disk, we get better performance from the disk, but what we do find is that the disk doesn't perform as well as it does when it's in its caddy. So the firmware on the drive appears to be optimized for use with this USB board. And in this case, for large far right tests, the drive initially gives around 250 megabytes for write performance, but once the write cache is saturated, which happens very quickly, it drops to around 195 megabytes per second, and that's about 14% slower than the Elements enclosure that performed at about 226 megabytes per second. And this performance deficit is actually consistently visible across the entire disk, with even the inner tracks producing 92 megabytes per second compared to 100 in the caddy, and that's around an 8% drop. For mixed file write performance, SATA attached with the write cache enabled produces only between 120 megabytes and 65 megabytes per second write speed, and this is significantly slower than in the enclosure, with around a 30% penalty. And this is likely related again to how the USB board manages the cache and how it reports write completions to the OS. So for mixed writes, it looks like the performance is a fair bit worse once the drive is removed from its closure. And this likely isn't an intentional attempt to dissuade shucking, as some might say. I think it's likely that the drive is just optimized to be used with the Elements Interface Board and the way that it manages the drive caching. And again, mixed file read performance isn't impacted, and the drive performs almost identically in the caddy when it's attached to SATA with the write cache enabled or with it disabled. And comparing rewrites to the files, again, the drive performs best in the caddy with around a 20% penalty when the SATA attached with write cache enabled, and about a 40% penalty when the cache is disabled in the OS. So let's also quickly look at temperatures because one of the main issues with disks in these caddies is temperature. And we see here three measures. With an ambient of 23 degrees C, we see that the drive in the caddy is running at about 46 degrees C, peaking at 48. And if you run in an open case with ample airflow all around, the drive peaks at 32 degrees C, which is about 16 degrees cooler. When testing inside a five bay cooled disk chassis, it maxes out about 37 degrees, around halfway between the two values. So although the elements enclosure is actually fairly spacious and air can flow into and out of it, it will still run the drives a fair bit warmer than in a typical NAS or even in an internal drive bay, given enough space or active cooling. Okay, so we're done with the shucking and comparing the performance results. So what are the takeaways about if you should shuck this drive? But before I get there, do quickly please like the video if it was useful or interesting, and do also consider a sub to the channel. I cover a lot of more in-depth topics on storage and home compute, and I focused on bringing data that reveals more about what's really going on. So I do really appreciate the support in growing my little corner of YouTube, so thank you ever so much for everything and the support you give me. So first of all, buying a drive in an enclosure can be cheaper, but it depends on the location and the time, and you cannot take it for granted. You also need to consider the possible risk around warranty, as it's far clearer if you buy a bare drive and you don't extract it from a caddy. If you do this carefully, you're probably going to be fine to replace the disc in the caddy if you do need to make a warranty claim. Mine had no clear signs of removal with no seals broken or damaged during the process. There were also no signs that the drive records that this anywhere in the smart data, but I can't completely rule out some trick WD play here. So test it well before removing the drive to minimize this risk. And although WD don't make it easy to open, there isn't a sign to me that they're actively trying to prevent it or catch people out here. I think the caddy just isn't designed to be user accessible. Now, secondly, pick your external drive carefully as depending on the drive size, you could pick up an SMR drive. And in this case, I avoided this by buying a capacity where WD appear not to make SMR drives. And this is at eight terabytes. Four or six terabytes may not be the same. 
WD don't seem to make strong claims about performance on these external drives, so really they can swap out drives without warning, and they don't have any specific obligation to include a specific drive of type or M model. Thirdly, and I think most importantly, and something I've not seen called out before, is that this model, at least, seems to be optimised for use in its caddy, and its performance outside its caddy is definitely reduced. I don't see any evidence of intentional configuration penalty to penalise shucking, but the drive does seem to be optimised to perform best in its caddy, so consider this if you're buying it for another purpose. And this doesn't mean it's a bad drive, and it's certainly it performs fully for read performance and actually produces really solid results here for a very quiet and cool drive, so for read optimised use, it's a great drive. For mixed writes, its performance is not great if using directly on a SATA connection, but if it just comes down to a significant discount and it serves your use case, then this could still be a good option. So as always, thank you again for taking the time and watching my video to the end, and I look forward to seeing you in the next.